Okay, moving on, we're going to move on now for our next theme, which is going to be the future of London. Um, we've got a very fascinating lineup, not to say well known lineup of speakers and panelists. First off, though, I'd like to welcome Sir Terry Farrell. Sir Terry probably needs little introduction as the founder of Farrell and Partners and uh, is London's most influential architect. If you've ever uh, stared in admiration at the Home Office building in Marsham Street or MI6 headquarters in Vauxhall or even my personal favourite, the ventilation towers of the Blackwall Tunnel, and wondered who on earth was responsible, then this is the man. Um, Terry, Sir Terry is going to come. Uh, he was awarded a CBE and a knighthood in 2001. Um, and uh, I'm going to welcome him to the stage now to talk to us. Uh, please welcome Mr. Terry Farrell. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to talk um, about London and uh, strategic planning and what are my view, my take on the future of London. Um, I was introduced mentioning um, buildings and... Um, of course, as an architect, uh, it's, one always gets uh, recognised by the buildings. Strategic thinking, strategic planning, is less um, easy to pin down, this is your idea, this is what your identity is, and what you were the author of it, because it's very much a collaborative and a shared thing. And the tendency has been always uh, for new ideas for cities, uh, by architects, by the construction industry, and indeed by politicians, to look for objects rather than strategies. Um, and that what we have done in London uh, in terms of buildings has translated very readily to, to emerging economies. And I have an office for now over 20 years um, in Hong Kong, which works in China. And city making in China is what I would call um, revolutionary city making. It's, um, they're making cities not only for the first time uh, of, of, an, of an order of uh, of, of size uh, and industrialization, but also they're making cities that are not the same kind of cities that we have known before. Today's uh, 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 Shanghai uh, and even Hong Kong, but certainly uh, other cities like Beijing, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, are taking on a shape and a character and, a, and, a, and transport structures and so on that are of another order of size and complexity. But they're they will eventually, I believe, become like London. They will eventually become what I would call evolutionary cities, and evolutionary city-making will become the norm once they're established. And I think um, what I'm going to just touch upon today is this, is this subject of to what extent does London need revolutionary or evolutionary city-making? And I, I've, I wrote this book, uh, Shaping London, um, two years ago, which I actually had the book launch in this room. Uh, it's a very nice room to meet uh, to, to talking. And it was about the layers of London and how one understands where to go next by understanding better where we've been and how we got to where we are. And that is very much the theme of evolutionary city making. And it's full of diagrams that um, uh, I drew about how, how to understand, say, the West End, that, uh, that there are streets that divide layers of social class, but also activity that shopping streets, government streets, and indeed railway streets, and with it goes a different kind of population. There's, there are stratas of, and layers of activity that are hidden there to be found re fairly readily when you look for them. And to understand this, and understand how London's become what is, I, I believe, generally accepted as the world's greatest livable metropolis, and there are not many metropoli that are really livable. And London is is way up there, possibly with New York uh, as its equal, but it, it's, 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 a, it's an extraordinary place, and yet how has it got there? How was it planned? And as Peter Ackroyd and others have commented, it has a kind of natural, organic development. It's not produced by a single grand plan. And that's a model for the future rather than a model of the past. And I think evolutionary, natural ways of ordering things is now much more possible with the new sciences of, um, uh, of computer mathematics and so on. We can begin to understand how natural order sorts itself out and has pattern making of a different kind. And um, as a result, I've got much more interested in the future of London, not from the point of view of buildings and objects, but the right strategy. 
Um, for example, I was fascinated some years ago, 10 years ago now, by the government's plan for... It be, actually, it began with uh, the, the Tory government, with Heseltine declaring it the Thames Gateway. It was picked up by Prescott and others. And the ambition of the Thames Gateway was invariably stated in building terms, or project terms is probably a better word, building a railway line or... Um, um, uh, particularly building housing to meet the housing shortage. And yet all the housing that with the government declared it wanted to put here could fit into one small town. It could fit in a corner of the Medway. What to do with the rest of it? And I, uh, I came out with the answer was that this has got to be, first of all, a great place to live. People are choosing where to live nowadays. And in talking to house builders, they said, well, the government may wish us to put quarter million or half a million houses here but we don't want to build any here because that's not where people want to be the demand isn't there and indeed demand is very flat out there because there are preferences in Britain about where to live most people will live on the west of London and I think that the first infrastructure to put here is to reinforce the landscape that's already there and to build it as a build up a place that's desirable and as a result there was 100 million pounds then allocated, has been spent creating all kinds of new green spaces. And it's one of the great success stories when people say nothing's happened in the Thames Gateway. I always say, actually, huge strides have been made. There are new country parks. There are ways of handling waste. All the, all the new eco-industries are out there. Sewage, waste, power generation. This is where 10% of the UK's power is generated. Also, cargo handling and so on. This is the engine room of London. But the new kind of engines that drive a city are now clean engines, just like railway stations you can live next to. You can now live next to all the other stuff uh, uh, with the new ideas of, of green technology and, and green industries. And as part of um, the, uh, my, my look at it, um, I actually looked at what might be done to uh, combine things like um, a flood control and one of the things that came up talking to Environment Agency and others was that it's flood management you need. And it's, perhaps islands might be a better way of managing storm, storm surge. And so I started putting islands out here and I started linking things up. I had ideas about um, uh, underwater turbines, bridges and connectivity. And I even at one stage said there could be new ports out here and even a new airport. At that point... Uh, there was a change of mayor, and, the, um, uh, and I was approached by the new mayor, Boris Johnson, to say, why don't we take the, um, uh, the airport pro uh, project much further forward? And I've got involved in this debate about the, the airport and where the airport should be. And, and, I, and I, at the time, said, I don't want to progress the airport idea because um, I intrinsically felt that to try and look at an airport as the answer is falling into the trap of the construction industry's, uh, what I would call, revolutionary city-making, which it loves because the construction industry and politicians like projects. Uh, and a brand-new airport, a big thing that you can look at and point to, is a much more sexy thing and, and, and can be often seen as a silver bullet that might solve a lot of problems. But in times of economic flatness, which may well be here, and I think we have to plan... Uh, for a future that is going to be much flatter than the growth we have seen uh, over the last 200 years. And I think that's now, that's much more now and much more right for our times, ecologically and, and, uh, and, 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 and sustainability thinking. And, and really, it, one isn't uh, really going to start with a solution and, and then hope that you can logically argue for, for how many problems it solves. I think it's much more interesting to look at um, a more broad and, and more evolutionary way of solving the, 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 the needs, the demands through networks, through, uh, through sharing, through combinations of things, making things work the way they are and also working with um, where people want to be. And um, I, I think that... This, this, the arguments for this airport tend to come back to a convergence of political argument, that, um, uh, which is very much supported by certain business uh, parts of the business community, and it certainly appeals to, the, to those in the west of London who are concerned about pollution and, and air noise. But there are many, many other arguments to say that £50 billion may be the transportation cost to build all this and the trains and what have you, 
but there has to move to flip London over and everything that goes with an airport, all the growth, all the jobs, all that living that goes with it could well cost another 50 billion on top and leave us with a big hole in the jobs and, 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 the, and, and what goes on in West London, which after all is where Britain is. The UK is on the, uh, is on the west side of London and the west side of London is the growth area and where people want to be for good reason. So step, take a step back then and just go through some of this, this evolutionary thinking and my arguments for it uh, in other areas of London. We, we have done master plans looking at the Royals, the Isle of Dogs and Greenwich in Docklands. We did the, the Greenwich master plan. They're not being built out quickly. The demand is not there. It is slow out there. But if you compare it, the further west you get, the bigger the demand. And I'll eventually come to where I think the biggest demand is. Uh, I'm fascinated by the post-industrial changes that are possible in the middle of London and the patterns of London. When the railways came in from uh, the south of England, they were bringing passengers. The north of England could stay outside the centre because originally they were bringing goods. So the Marble Euston Road and, and the Grand Union Canal distributed all the, all the coal, uh, the horse and cart, to all the, all the fireplaces and so on, all, 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 all the places that... Every, every room in London was heated as a result of bringing coal into these stations or into the docks and being distributed by horse and cart around London. But coming from the south, they could only bring people. And to bring people in, they had to stay at high level and try and get across the river. And that staying at high level on what was the mud bank side of the Thames, because the deep water is on the other side, which is why the north of London has progressed, created this barrier, this, this elevated barrier that runs al along of the railway lines that captures a piece of land between the railway lines and the river. And, and in many ways, that is part of central London. And yet, politically, we're divided into three boroughs. Uh, and, and none of those boroughs think that bit of the yellow bit is any different to the other bit, or they didn't. Now they are beginning to see it as much more part of central London. So City Hall is now uh, within this yellow band. Uh, and, of course, the great museums, the Zion Museum and, and the, uh, uh, the Tate, uh, and the cultural centres and the old county hall. Uh, and then coming round, you've got Battersea and, um, and the American Embassy uh, moving out to Nine Elms. And this is, a, this is shifting. It's a post-industrial realignment that's going on that's think, saying, well, these places are actually habitable. There are, there are vast areas that are actually still going through the process of post-industrial um, realisation of habitability um, without having to go east, without having to go where the demand is not so great. Uh, and this is part of our plans. We're working for Lambeth on Vauxhall Central. We're working at how to tame roads, how to make livability, how to bring density, not only to uh, uh, post-industrial land, but also to housing estates and where people live. Uh, uh, at very low densities. There's another pattern that's very fascinating. If the railways are one pattern, the rivers are another, and, and I'm not going to try and cover all these things, but I want to give you a flavour of my thinking here. If you move on from the Lambeth um, uh, and, and the banks that were industrial ones, this is the, this is the 19th century view of, of that river bank at Nine Elms. But if you look at um, the pattern of rivers... And, and it's a very interesting pattern of back rivers where you can see the industry. This is the Lee, and right over here is the Brent. But in the middle of London, there are rivers that I would call front rivers. They're, they, they're livable, uh, uh, and that's where the housing is, and, and the park. So that Hyde Park is the, is the, is the Westbourne. And, and all the names around it, like Knightsbridge and uh, Bayswater, all take their names from the good, clean water of the front river. And the other one, of course, is the Tyburn that makes the lakes and the parks at uh, Regent's Park, Green Park, St. James's Park, and the palaces, and, and the great living areas of Mayfair, Marylebone, and St. John's Wood are all on those rivers. And there are other front rivers, but there are back rivers in the middle. There is the fleet that ca carries not only Smithfield Market with its carcasses and what have you, King's Cross, up to Camden Town and Railway Land. And there's this one that fascinates me a lot, and I'll come to in more detail which is uh, variously called Chelsea Creek uh, and also Counters Creek. And it's the kind of Chelsea Valley, as it were. And it used to supply the coal and the goods from a back river. And back rivers 
are the engines of, the, of, of, uh, of these neighborhoods in, 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 in 19th and early 20th century. And the reason was that everything was delivered by horse and cart, so you needed industry, you needed supply right to the center here. Um, of course, with scale changes, all the power stations went downstream, the sewage went out, and in the end, you're left with areas of back river that we're now today making into uh, um, uh, front, front river locations. And there's vast potential in those areas. And if you take the Chelsea Creek and look at uh, all along it, you get uh, Lotts Road, Stamford Bridge, which is a big football stadium, things that look to be dumped on where uh, they, they're kind of bad neighbors. Uh, there are cemeteries, hospitals, football stadiums traditionally are, are antisocial in, 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 in the, uh, as a neighbor. There's, I'm not picking on Chelsea here. I'm sure it's true of Arsenal and anywhere else. Uh, Earl's Court, I'll come to in a minute. There's Olympia. There's White City and the whole of that area where the shopping centre is being dumped and Old Oak Common. We are doing a scheme at Lotts Road. This is, our, uh, this is the power station, the rethinking of the power station. This is our rethinking of the, uh, and our master plan for the exhibition halls at, uh, uh, at Earl's Court where we are able to get on backlands there, uh, the river running right through the middle. This is the Chelsea Creek. It's this long line that goes through all this. Cemetery over here, cemeteries are there because it's a back river. And railway lands uh, and some council estates, but mostly exhibition halls. There you can get uh, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 new homes in the west of London where there is still land available and you can make new urban villages and new living quarters. White City, where we're involved in helping one of the landowners. This is another big area, large shopping centre, but to the north of it, vast areas uh, now being replanned. And the final thing I'm going to finish with is, um, is Old Oak Common. Old Oak Common is where the railway lines uh, and the motorways all, all pinch in together. So this is the, the railway line that goes out to the west coast. This is the railway line that goes out to Bristol and Wales. They will be located in here, new crossrail station, and high speed one is going to be located there, located there. And there's only a kilometre between the two railway lines. And there are five tube lines, including the West London and, and the North London line, Central, Bakerloo, and so on uh, at that location. But there is also the biggest employment complex in the whole of London here, which is Park Royal. There are 70,000 people work there. It could if it turbocharged, if one looks at putting and reinforcing where people are and want to be, then I think there are great growth potential here. And capitalizing upon the rail hub, which could be an extraordinary rail hub, is what we have been asked to do by various bodies. Uh, we've worked with TfL, but primarily with Hammersmith and Fulham Council. And we've designed so that the, the crossrail station and the new high-speed station could actually be looked at uh, to have a, 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 an equivalent of a Docklands light railway and the kind of infrastructure that's been going into the east where the demand is not so great, here where the demand is high and the problem is congestion, you can actually then service it with better infrastructure and reinforce what's there. And though, so what I've been in arguing is that perhaps the answer to, to, to the future, and this is my last slide, uh, of, of, of the air problem is to look at where people want to be and to network what we've got and make it much, a much cleverer solution than actually build totally flipping London over and starting again with all that that means. That this is the, the rail hub, which I call the national rail hub. This is where it will be 30 minutes to Birmingham <coughs> Airport, about 40 minutes to Birmingham, and of course going up with high speed two to the north. And of course it connects through crossrail and it connects to high speed one. And my suggestion is, and I think it's a, a suggestion that we're now working through with various engineers, is it's only 10, it will be only 10 minutes from Heathrow. There has been a suggestion that with a, a 5 billion uh, 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 rail uh, underground high speed connection from Heathrow to Gatwick, running under the M25 and the M23, that would be 15 minutes. It would only be 15 minutes doing exactly the same under the M1 and going up the, uh, under the M25 and up the M1 to Luton. That's about the same distance, if not slightly nearer. If there was another runway at Luton and Gatwick, you'd actually get 210 million. You're getting up to the kind of passenger figures you'd get from a hub airport. But you could do this step at a time. You could do it in the 
chunks, little chunks, I was going to say, of five, five billion rather than <laughs> the 50 billion single thing you have to do all at once. And then to all the other stuff that makes an airport work with it. You could go step at a time here and you could actually invent, as the British are clever at doing, a completely new idea of a networked airport where it's not a hub in, in, in the sense that the Chinese are building. And I don't think we need to copy the Chinese. I think we need to be uh, cleverer and smarter. And we've also got to be appropriate because um, the future of Britain is measuring our size, measuring our ambition to what we can afford and actually be clever about networking <coughs> and systems uh, and using what we've got in a legal evolutionary way. Uh, that's my very quick, rapid uh, canter through a lot of uh, ideas. Um, and, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>